Hi everyone, I'm Matt Clark, Research Analyst for Money and Markets, uh, and here with me is Charles Sizemore, co-editor of Green Zone Fortunes, live from uh, from Peru, uh, the scenic vistas once again of, of Peru, and it is time uh, for our weekly series of Investing with Charles. Uh, Charles, first off, welcome, and it's glad that the uh, the sun is shining and uh, things are, are, are nice and bright uh, in, in Peru, but uh, t- today I, I want to kind of take a little bit different, uh, a little bit different approach here. Um, you know, it's it's no secret that you know one of the greatest wealth generators out there is the stock market, and and investing in the stock market is certainly something that we we, we clearly advocate. I mean, we, we probably wouldn't have jobs. This is what we do. do. Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> it is in fact what we do. Um, however, uh, you know, if you look back to January and even a little bit in December, uh, one thing is for sure uh, w- regarding the market, and that is there is volatility. Things can go down just as fast, if not even faster, than they go up. So it's not, it, it is a good idea as a smart investor uh, to kind of diversify yourself. Don't put everything in, into one. We always we always preach that not only with, with money and markets, but with greens and fortunes. You know, don't put all your eggs into one basket, whether it's one stock or one ETF, you know, diversify yourself. And we can take that a step further and, and, and diversify yourself uh, e- even a different way. And that is not just put all your money into the stock market to generate wealth, but also look at other avenues. And I thought this was perfect uh, to, to, to bring you in into the fold here because uh, you know, as uh, you have mentioned uh, on Money in Markets, uh, you are now, and I, I say this with all loving and, and, uh, and admiration, but you've become uh, the latest slumlord in, in the US. And I say that jokingly. Oh. You're not actually a slumlord, but yeah, you know, just you know, no, I, I did. I did previously live in this house, and it is in a really nice, charming 1950s neighborhood with white picket fences and you know, children riding bicycles in the streets. Uh, so it's really not a slum, but uh, yes, I, I have it's, in fact joined the ranks of America's landlords. It's it's not the equivalent of a beaten down house that you would see in in uh, you know in, in in any neighborhood. It's, it's not uh, some turn of the twentieth twentieth century like New York tenement apartment from uh, you know gangs of New York or something. It's uh, right. it, It's not that. But it does bring about an interesting question and interesting perspective that I want to I want to get from you, and that is about utilizing things like rental property or or, or real estate or other things like that as an additional revenue producer for a smart investor. So, so talk about that a little bit and, and, and kind of how that process can work, what, what it could mean, how difficult is it to get into? You know, let, let's kind of cover as many bases as we can with that. Sure, sure. So before we do that, let's back up one minute. You know, why not do real estate? Why invest in the stock market? There's numerous reasons. The first, of course, being the stock market has been wildly profitable, a massive generator of wealth over the last 200 years. To not participate in that would be insane. Um, you know, the, the wealth creation is there. Beyond that, it's also extremely liquid. It's very easy to get in and out of the stock market. If you, even 401k, whatever. You know, if you want out of an investment, you pretty well snap your fingers and you're out. Uh, more illiquid investments like real estate are, are clearly not like that. You know, it takes weeks to get or, or, or longer to buy a property. It can take weeks or longer to sell a property. Uh, lawyers are involved, contracts, you know, agents. You know, there's all these uh, hurdles to get through to make that possible. So uh, investing in, in, in the stock market is always going to be preferable for a large chunk of your assets just because it's easy. It's easy and it's you know historically profitable. But as we discussed, you don't want to have all of your eggs in that basket. You can go through periods where even fantastic stocks don't do well. Through, of course, doing a more short-term trading strategy. Uh, some of the things we discuss in, in, in Green Zone Fortunes and some of Adam's uh, trading services, it's kind of a different story. But if, if you're talking about your buy and hold portfolio, you might be buying and holding for a really long time. As we saw from 2000 to 2013, the S&P 500 went nowhere, as we saw from uh, – Oh, what was it, 1968 or so to uh, uh, 1982, the market also essentially went nowhere. So there can be stretches where it just doesn't really pay to be purely a stock investor if you need income, if you need, you know, if you're living off these investments, it pays to have something that doesn't, um, that's not correlated with the market. And that's, that's where something like a rental house can come into play. Stock market could go up, it could go down, it could go sideways, it could do some 
you know, heretofore never seen technical uh, thing, uh, figure eight, if that was possible on a stock chart, whatever. Uh, it's not going to affect the the performance of the of, of the rental property. The rental property is going to have its own idiosyncratic risks. Um, you know, my tenant could flake out on me. Um, I don't know. The neighborhood could. I mean, I could move back into the neighborhood and cause property values to instantly crash because you know who wants to live with me? Um, yeah, you know, any number of things can happen that could cause a, a, a rental investment like that to not perform as expected. But it's not going to be something. In, from the stock market, it, it has a different set of risk, and that's what makes it attractive. Talk about those risks and how you can kind of, you know, maybe kind of mitigate that. I mean, you've got experience with this being a uh, now a, a rental property owner. Um, let's talk about those risks a little bit, and 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 how, as a proper potential property owner, you can kind of uh, maybe work past those a little bit. The biggest is you need a margin of safety because you know dividend stock you're going to get paid your quarterly dividend. And unless the company really hits financial stress, which does happen, um, you're not likely to see an interruption there. But with a rental property, you know, maybe it takes longer to get the thing rented than you thought. Maybe there were some repairs you didn't take into account. Maybe you were too aggressive in your assumptions on how easy it would be to get a renter. You thought you had a renter tomorrow and it actually takes a month or two to find somebody. Um, during those periods where there's no income coming in, you're covering the mortgage, you're covering the utilities, you're covering the, the, the yard care, you're covering whatever, if something breaks, that's on you. You're covering all those expenses. So you do need to make sure that you have ample cash in reserve, apart from what you're using for the down payment, apart from what you're using elsewhere. You need to make sure you do have an emergency stash of cash to dip into for those times when the, the property isn't cash flowing. You know, that's a big deal. Um, secondly, uh, remember that you know, when you're, how do I put this? You know, when you're kind of budgeting out your what your expected expenses are going to be, you're not the tenant. When you live in the house and it's your property, there are things you may just except like, oh, you know, there's a chip in the countertop. I should probably fix that. But now my kids will just break it again next week. I'm not going to mess with it right now. When you're when you're when you're a tenant and you're, you're paying somebody else rent, you kind of expect things to be, you know, ship shape all the time. And so yeah, just but, you know, whatever if you think your expenses are going to be, they're going to be higher. Furthermore, when you live in the house yourself, you can kind of do some things yourself. You can kind of cut a few corners here and there, not to do shoddy work, but just you, you can kind of keep the price down because at the end of the day, you care. It's coming out of your pocket. If you're if you're renting it, you know you may have a property manager doing it for you. You may have a, a repair guy. He doesn't have that same focus on cost control you do. At the end of the day, it's not his his property. He's a hired gun. He doesn't care if you know the repair bill ends up being 300 bucks instead of 100 bucks or whatever 50 bucks instead of five bucks it, it, it's not really his problem so you just keep in mind there are going to be vastly higher expenses than you expect and you have to factor that into your your assumptions if you're thinking hey i'm going to clear a thousand bucks a month on this maybe you're only clearing 800 you know maybe you're clearing 500 but yeah it just you have to have that margin of safety if it's tight don't do it if, you've, if you're barely covering your mortgage, don't do the deal. Why like You will end up losing money on it, likely. Now, the other thing is, is that some people may, may be relatively new to this and, and think, okay, this is something I kind of want to get into, but is this necessarily the right time for me? Because essentially, unless you already have the property, unless you already, you were, in your case, the previous owner, you were the owner of the property, you lived in it and decided to, to move somewhere else. So you have this, you already have the asset. Um, but in a lot of cases, that's not really the instance that, you know, the, people have to go and search out and buy the property, uh, fix it up, and then turn it to be a rental property. So is this necessarily the right market for that to happen? Oh, that's a really good point. So for me, the rental is profitable right out of the gate because I've owned the property for 11 years. My costs are in 11 years ago prices. My mortgage is based on what property values would have been 11 years ago, whereas rents are today's higher prices. So for me, I cover the, and plus I'm 
exceptionally fiscally conservative. I had a ton of equity in the property. I made huge down payments when I bought it, et cetera, et cetera. So I had, um, for me to cover those expenses, it was very, very easy with, 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 with rent assumptions. Somebody buying a new property, it's, it's, it, it may or may not be. You really, you know, there's that old expression, all politics is local, all real estate is local. The uh, the prices, you know, that that price to rent uh, ratio, if you will, may be really favorable to landlords in some neighborhoods. It may be really favorable to tenants and others. What you have to do in this case is you have to do your homework. You have to go look for, uh, you know, comparable rents in the area um, and, and don't just, you know, do a quick screen on Zillow or something. I mean, like really, you know, get out there and look, um, get, find credible data points and really be uh, objective as possible about that. What can I reasonably expect to pull in and rent? And then look at the prices. Um, is there inventory? Can I buy this at a price that would allow me to kind of get that spread where my rents are easily covering the mortgage? And if the math doesn't work out, wait. You know, I have a buddy that owns you know 10 or 12 rental houses now, and he hasn't bought anything in several years because you know in the neighborhoods he was looking, prices just weren't there. He couldn't really cover the, uh, the financing and, and get the profit that he wanted, so he's just sitting on a lot of cash right now. So you really have to look in your, in your neighborhood. You have to look at the numbers, and you do have to be patient. Yeah, it's not as simple. I think a lot of people have this uh, you know, misconception that I, I watch TLC or something like that. And I see these people just go and they buy property, they flip it, and then and then they either resell it or they rent it or whatever. And it's just that easy. And it's, it's that, that easy. Not, it just, it works like that on exactly the time frame, And, you know, everybody's smiling and shaking hands. No, it, it doesn't work. It does like not. That. It's not even close to that. And I think when you say do your homework, that's a that, that's a big thing to look at. It's a lot more than just doing your homework to research a stock. You've got to look at the area. You've got to look at you know, like you said, the, the comparable rents. Um, you know, look at the market. Uh, then you know, you have to go to the, the the county appraiser's office and find out what are the comps in terms of um, you know sale prices. Are you getting a deal? Well, what, you know, how does that match? You know, how does that match the mortgage you pay and the rent you collect? And what's your profit margin? I mean, you have you have to have a you have to be very detailed. There's also the headache factor. So let me let me tell you what what I'm uh, tell me tell you what I'm dealing with right now. So I ordered a new kitchen sink, and it arrived. The uh, contractor was supposed to install it. Fine. I'm not even in the country right now, as you can see. There are palm trees. I'm in Peru. Uh, I, I'm not there to deal with this. And the contractor calls me. Hey, the uh, the sink's broken. Has a big crack in it. Well. Now what? I'm having to call Home Depot, have them go to the house. I'm not even there to deal with it. They're having to, to deal with whoever's at the house right now. Um, it, it's, it's a headache. It'll get fixed. But this is taking time that I don't really want to spend on this. And uh, that that's part of the game. So um, now you obviously you can get property managers that are more hands on. Some are more hands on than others. Some cost more than others. That's that's also part of the part part of the, uh, the calculus you have to do as well. But uh, yeah, there is, you definitely have to factor that headache factor and you have to factor that headache factor. I am being quite redundant, but you do have to take into account, shall I say, the headache factor. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things at play here. And I can say it's not, it's not as simple as, uh, as what you might see on TV or what other people may suggest how easy it is. Because it's not. Are, are you I, suggesting that reality TV does not actually reflect reality? I, I know. <laughs> I, 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 there, there's a possibility I get hate mail for that, but I, I'm okay with that. I really, I'm not, a, I'm not a reality TV guy, but I do understand that reality is kind of an, it's kind of inappropriate uh, to suggest when, 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 when looking at that, it's not really reality. It's just live action, you know, is, is more accurate, but uh, yeah, there, you have to really heavily scripted live action. Yeah, so when you yeah. do see these property flipping shows, that's heavily scripted. It's you know you don't what you don't see is all the you know the be real stuff that uh, that gets cut. Yeah, and the other thing you have to take into account here is when you look at that, you're likely following people who this is their living. They have crews that they work with. They have crews that are on their payroll. Um, they, or paid they actors have... that make it look good. Yeah, exactly. This is this is not a, a one off. This is not someone like like Charles who has one piece of property they're dealing with. They're running out. It was you know the, the situation is completely different than what 
you would likely face unless you were a massive property owner somewhere. And if you are, then you already know most of these things and, and you're taking all that into account. But if you are, uh, you know, me or Charles or, or well, any- and, and on, along those lines. So one thing I would really recommend is uh, find a good property manager. There are companies that handle this. You could find someone local, it's just a local dude who runs a few houses, or you can go with a larger kind of corporate uh, land, um, not landlord, corporate uh, management company, but do it. It generally, it's not going to be that expensive. They're going to take a good chunk of that first month's rent as kind of a, a booking fee or whatnot. And then they're going to charge you anywhere from, you know, hundred or $2 a month to just kind of deal with it. Um, it, it it's worth it as a general rule, unless you just like kind of getting into the weeds and dealing with the stuff if you have a busy career, you're busy with family, or you just kind of like the idea of keeping that separation between you and the tenant so it doesn't get too personal, it, it is, which, which I, I think is a good idea to keep that separation. You um, go, with the, go with the professional manager. It will reduce your profit by the cost of their management, but it's generally worth it. And if the deal is kind of kind of iffy, you're not sure if it's, if it's break even or not. And you know, that, that management fee kind of makes a difference. Walk away from the deal. At that point, your, mar your, your margins are too tight. You don't really have that margin of safety you need. Um, just don't do the deal. So at the end of the day, obviously, you know, diversification is, is kind of the overarching theme that we're talking about here. And it's not just diversification uh, with, with your basket of stocks or your investments. It's diversification of your entire uh, you know, wealth portfolio here. And everything you're looking at that you're trying to generate wealth for, be it for retirement, be it for uh, just anything that you're doing that you are trying to, you know, create wealth outside of your, your, your job, your salary, uh, sure. and, and all that. Uh, you know, there are ways to, you know, diversify that even more beyond the stock market, because as we've, as, as we've experienced, the stock market can be volatile. And, and it's not necessarily a great idea to throw everything into that and hope that you're going to reach this massive wealth goal at the end of whatever your time period is. So um, last question I'll let you get here, Charles, is it worth it for you? Yeah, in my case, it was worth it. The numbers worked out. Um, there is a little headache, but because I use a manager, that headache is manageable. It was absolutely worth it. But again, because the numbers worked out. Very good. Um, again, I, I do want to let everyone know that if you do have a question or maybe there's a stock or, or a sector that you'd like Adam or Charles or myself to look at, uh, you can do that by emailing us. Feedback at moneyandmarkets.com is the email address. We'll put that down below. Also, you can comment down below here on YouTube as well. Uh, we look at both and, and we take questions from both. And if we uh, if we do use your question, you ask it, we use it. Uh, we will hook you up with some cool Money and Markets gear, t-shirt, sweatshirts, hats, all sorts of good stuff that we have uh, lined out. Also, I would be remiss if I did not mention Green Zone fortunes. This is our, uh, our premium investment service. Uh, Adam, Charles, and I provide a ton of research, analysis, insight, uh, as well as that one stock every month that we feel is going to blow the doors off the market. Uh, we give it to you all for less than the price of a cup of coffee uh, a month. So uh, you can get all that. We'll, we'll put a link up top here so you can find out more uh, about Green Zone Fortunes. Very, uh, You have access to Adam, Charles, and myself. Uh, our insight uh, our, our, you know, their intelligence and my whatever, whatever you want to call it. I, I don't know my personality, your face, I guess. Your, your face for radio? My face for radio, exactly. <laughs> uh, long running joke that I do have that. Um, so I would encourage you to check that out as well. Also, check out moneymarkets.com. It is uh, your home for, uh, you know, safe, sound, smart, simple, profitable investment information for your portfolio. Uh, the entire team works very hard to give you all that information seven days a week delivered to your inbox for free. Also check out our Green Zone rating system there. You can use that to uh, monitor and check out our proprietary Green Zone rating for any number of about 6,000 stocks out there. Find out how we rate it. You check out our metrics. Uh, you can get uh, you know a lot of data, a lot of information, anything that we've written about it. Uh, and you can find out all that information. It's all usable for you for free at moneyandmarkets.com. So he is uh, Green Zone Fortunes co editor Charles Sizemore. I am Money Markets Research Analyst Matt Clark. Until next time, everyone, safe trading.